Up at our train club, we get a lot of groups come in to visit our model railroad. And a lot of them are school groups. And quite a few are homeschool groups. And I got to tell you something. There's a difference. There's a difference. You bring in a group of homeschool kids, I'm always impressed. Always impressed. They seem to be, for some reason, more polite, and they seem to really know what's going on in the world. I give two talks about the Saluda grade. I've done them both here before. Uh, I think the opening, the grand opening of it, I did a talk about the history of why, why and how they built it and, and the ramifications and so on. And then about a year later, I did a talk here about all the wrecks that occurred on the Saluda grade because that's something you don't hear very much about. I'm going to do two things. I'm going to give you a tour of the actual grade through photographs because uh, most of you, I, I venture to say almost all of you in this room, have never actually walked the Saluda grade or seen it. You can parallel it by driving uh, Pearson Falls Road, but you either have to look way up or way down, and for the most part, you can't see anything. So I'll give you a little brief tour so you know what the Saluda grade really looks like. Very similar to this diorama that we built for the, for the depot here. Then I'm going to tell you how the railroad went about taking a train up the grade and down the grade, because it was a, it was a project to get a train, especially uh, up the grade. And then I'm going to tell you about all the wrecks that occurred. This is a map of the Saluda grade. This dotted line right here is the tracks. Okay, so we're up in Saluda right now. We're at the top of the grade. As you leave Saluda, it makes about a 90 degree turn and starts downhill. The actual top of the grade is about where the street right here crosses the tracks. So instantly you're going downhill. Now, if you picture, well, freight trains back in, in the late 1800s and around 1900 were not very long. They're not like the trains you see today. A typical freight train might only be 20 or 25 cars. Today they're generally at least 100 to 150 cars. But a train is literally draped over the crest of the hill when it's sitting here in town because these tracks go downhill this way toward Lake Summit. So, you're, so part of your train is pulling back this way and the other part of the train is pulling that way. As you crest the hill, all the momentum shifts and it puts all that weight on the locomotive as it starts downhill. And so the engineer really has to know how to control a train in hilly country. It's much, much more difficult. And I'm talking about the days of steam locomotives. It's a whole different animal with diesels. But with steam locomotives, the guy really had to know his stuff to handle up and down hills. Uh, places like the loops up in Old Fort and Marion, where you're constantly going up and down, up and down. You could have part of your train going uphill, part of your train going downhill, another part going uphill, and another part going downhill, all at the same time. And these strains on the couplers and everything are held to, to deal with when you're driving a locomotive. So just remember that when you think about a train leaving here and starting down the grade. Uh, I want to point out some of the names in red there so that when I'm giving my talk, you know where I'm talking about. As you turn and go out of Saluda, you start downhill. and It's pretty much a straight run. It kind of meanders a little bit, but they're not really curves. But when you get down here, you've got a very sharp, about 120 degree turn. It's called sand cut. This was actually a... a a hill across here and they had to cut into it for the train to go through. That's where most of the wrecks occurred because they would lose control and they gained speed going down here and just like on a car if you're going too fast on a curve you're going to be thrown to the outside of the curve and crash. If you didn't crash there this continued downhill and you crashed here at Slaughter Pen Cut and I'll tell you how it got its name. Uh, and you're probably familiar with Melrose. All these tracks are still down there. That was the staging area for the trains going up and down the hill. They had to stop and do some things to the trains before they negotiated the hill. The Saluda grade is three miles long, exactly three miles long from here to the, uh, to the first turnout you encounter when you get into Melrose. It's a constant 5% grade the whole way. And if you have trouble picturing what a 5% grade is, 
in a standard passenger car in a train, if two guys the same height were to stand at two ends of the car, the guy at the low end would be looking at the belt buckle of the guy at the upper end. So that's how much of a difference there is within the length of a passenger car. That's a 5% grade. When you get out here on I-26, you know, you got that long grade and there's a big sign there, caution 7% grade. You see how, that's, how steep that is? Well, this is slightly less than that. And picture getting hundreds and hundreds of tons of train up and down a hill like that. An automobile is not so much of a project. You're talking about three or 4,000 pounds, okay? As a matter of fact, I was thinking about this on the way down. A modern day coal hopper, one loaded coal hopper, weighs more than all the cars that brought you people here tonight combined. One, and they run 100 car coal trains these days. Uh, back when, the, when all the wreck, wrecks occurred, on the grade, a typical uh, train would have maybe a dozen to 15 coal hoppers on it. It's still a lot of weight. So that was, that was the problem, the weight versus the steepness of the grade and the two sharp curves. We pull out of town here and we start down the grade. And you can see the track immediately starts to drop off. It goes around a 90 degree bend and then the two tracks come together into a single track the rest of the way down the grade. And this is sort of the way it meanders down towards sand cut. That fellow's a member of our club and he was with me the day that we took the pictures and walked the grade. Just before the curve in sand cut, Pearson Falls Road goes under the tracks, comes out on the outside. And the interesting thing about this is this is a stream here. I believe it's called either Joey's or Joel's Creek. That goes under the road and comes out on the other side. So you've got a stream with a road crossing it with a train crossing it. That's an that's unusual feature. You're entering sand cut. And you can see how they cut into the bank there to make it. Now this shot is shot going uphill. And I did that for a reason. I wanted to get a good shot of these rocks. That particular rock formation has a name. It's called Talopot Rock. I know what a tallow pot is, but I don't know why they named that rock. A tallow pot was used by the rail uh, people to, uh, they would put kerosene in it and it would heat the switches so they wouldn't freeze back before they had the electric heaters and the oil fired heaters. Uh, but that, that rock is called tallow pot rock. And all these pictures were taken about five years ago when I was designing the uh, diorama that's in the Heritage Museum up in Hendersonville. So these are pretty current. Uh, there's mile marker 34. Uh, we're at mile marker 32 up here. So that's two miles from right here. We got one mile to go. Continues on down. And then you come to a sign that says start timing sector. Just remember that. I'm going to talk about it later. Getting near, the, and there's an end timing sector. Those two signs are 1,000 feet apart. And I'll explain what they're used for. And we get to the bottom. That bridge over Pearson Falls Road is considered to be the bottom of the Saluda grade. So I just took you on a three mile walk. And the, the track flattens out there, it levels out. That track off to the right is the second safety runaway track. That's still in existence and uh, it could still be operated if needed. But then on the left there, we enter the Melrose uh, yard. And that's in the Melrose yard looking back at the grade. So you can see how suddenly you're in the grade. I mean, within a couple hundred feet, you're going from level to a 5% grade. And this is the Melrose yard. Uh, typical freight train would pull into Melrose coming up from Spartanburg. And it would be, let's say, 21 or 22 cars in length. They could not pull that train up the grade. Uh, without several locomotives. But what they did is the railroad had a one steam locomotive that would sit here, right up the street, and I'll show you in a picture where it sat. He'd sit up here and he'd hang out in the depot and he'd wait for a telegraph to come through saying you got a, a train coming up from Melrose, from uh, Spartanburg. He would jump on this helper locomotive and he'd go down to Melrose and he'd sit down there and when the train would pull in, 
they would cut off the first six or seven cars on the train and those seven cars and the road locomotive would start up the grade and this helper would come behind and those two locomotives would push the cars up here and they'd drop them off right across the street here where there's a passing siding. Then the two locomotives would go down and get another third of the train and bring it up and then the final third. So it took nearly an hour to get a train three miles and they do this day and night because there were 30 some trains going through here in a given day. And that's, that's all they would do, is just go down there and get, get the cars, bring them up, get the cars, bring them up, 24-7. Quite great job, huh? <laughs> but anyway, that's what it took to get a train up the grade back in the early days of uh, steam. Because this helper engine resided here, they needed to be able to service it, to put coal in it, put water in it, sand, and so on and so forth. So this was a whole service facility over where the weeds are growing on the left. There was a coaling tower. Uh, there was a water tank on the right. They had an ash pit to dump the ash out of the uh, boiler. They had a sanding tower to put sand in the, in the locomotive. Those domes up there hold sand. And there's nozzles that go down right in front of the driving wheels. And the engineer can pull a lever and it'll shoot sand on the track so he can get grip. So all steam locomotives carried sand, and diesels do too, you just don't see the, the sand bin. But that's what those domes are, they're in the middle of a steam locomotive, they're for sand. So all those services were provided here in Melrose, and sometimes the road engine that was coming through needed more coal or water or whatever, so they had it down there. So that's the reason that Melrose existed. So you continue out of Melrose, and this is heading south toward Tryon, it's, it's double track because when they bring a train in, the trains were getting longer and longer. They had to have a pretty good length of uh, double track to house the train while they brought it up a third at a time. And also that was a good spot for a train going south to pass. They could pass each other. This is slaughter pen cut through here first. It's a right hand bend and then a left hand bend. So you can imagine a train out of control doing 75 miles an hour. You think it's going to make it through there? I don't. <laughs> and then finally it comes back to a single track and goes down to Tryon. So you've just taken a tour of the whole Saluda grade facility, including the yard that the, managed the trains. For those of you who know locomotives, they generally used a Santa Fe type or a consolidation type locomotive as the pushers. You wanted a locomotive that had small diameter wheels and a lot of them. That gives you a lot of power at a low speed. Passenger trains have fewer wheels and they're bigger. I'm talking again about steam locomotives. They had to have a lot of grunt. Uh, here in Saluda, and all these tracks still exist, that helper locomotive would sit over here. And of course you know the depot wasn't here in those days, it was down the street. Are you all aware of that? Yes. Okay. But at one time when it was down the street, that helper locomotive would sit over there on the left and as they'd bring cars up, they'd park them on that center track. Where those junk cars are now, that's where the depot sat. Well, let's talk about taking a train down the, down the grade. Train would come into Saluda and they would stop and there was on each, okay, brakes on a train are air activated. There's a compressor in the locomotive that pumps air into a, a line that runs through all the cars. If you ever look at a, underneath a, a freight car, you'll see a, a, a line, usually a, a steel uh, tube that goes from one end of the car to the other and you see a rubber hose hanging out the end and when they couple up, they connect those hoses together. That's an air line. And in the caboose, they would have a uh, air gauge. So when they couple up a train to take a trip, they would pump air in this line and the conductor who rode in the caboose would watch the pressure gauge and when it got up to about 90 PSI, uh, he would signal the engineer that they've got the proper pressure for the brakes. So when the, when the engineer would pull the lever for the brakes, it would shoot air back there and all the brake shoes would clamp onto the wheels. Well, they had something called brake retainers on each car, and it was, it was just a valve that, that uh, 
the, the brakeman would throw on each car so that if, if you picture this, you're driving your car and, you, and you're going to go down a hill. You put the brakes on, you have to hold your foot on the brakes going down that hill if you want the brakes activated. Okay, well, in a locomotive, this is done with a lever. You wouldn't want to be sitting there pulling on this lever for three miles. So these, what these retainers did was you would, you would apply a certain amount of brake, and when you release the lever, the brakes would stay where you set them. So you could let go and you had brakes. If you wanted more brakes, you could pull a little harder on the lever and they'd stay set. That way the engineer was free to do the rest of his work and the brakes were applied all the way down the hill. So they would stop here, they'd set the brake retainers on every car, they'd have to walk the length of the train and throw these levers. Okay, when they got down to the bottom in Melrose, they'd get off the train, release all the levers. So that was the process to take a train down the hill. They did not break the train into pieces, they took the whole thing down. And there were occasions when they used the helper engine on the back to help slow the train and hold it back. All right? But that's, an, that's important because one of the key wrecks on the grade was because of a brake failure. Let's talk about the wrecks. Uh, as you probably know, the first train came here in 1878. Uh, and the Saluda grade was born, it went into use, and uh, there was a lot of criticism of the railroad to, to try to do something like this and make it safe, but they were convinced that they could handle it. Well, two years after it opened, 1880, there was a runaway train, and I have not been able to find out any facts about it other than 14 men were killed and I believe it was all convicts. They used convict labor to build the grade. I believe that it was a train that uh, a coupler broke and it came uncoupled and se uh, several cars rolled backwards down the track and these guys were killed. They were probably chained together or whatever, I don't know. Like I said, I can't find any facts on it, but I, but I found several references to the fact that there was a wreck and eight, 14 guys were killed. Uh, the next wreck that occurred was in 1878, and again, this involved convict labor. Uh, the reason, even though the grade was open, the reason there was still convict labor is they were building on up to Hendersonville. So they, they, they'd work up there, and I guess they were housing the prisoners down here uh, somewhere. I'm not sure where. But uh, six convicts, two guards, and a foreman were killed when a train ran away. Uh, the crew that was driving the locomotive jumped off, but uh, these guys didn't make it. Now we get into the wrecks that, that are documented. 1890, three men were killed by a train. Uh, uh, the tracks were wet, and they were headed downhill, and before the engineer realized that he had lost control, uh, he was building up a lot of speed, and at that, I don't think that at that point they had the eight mile an hour limit in place. I'm not sure, I haven't been able to find out. But by the time he realized he was out of control, he tried, he and the crew tried to do everything they could to save the train. They have a few things they can do, but not much. But they all stayed on the train and they were all killed. Uh, by the time it reached Melrose, they estimated it was doing 75 miles an hour and it went into what's, what's now called Slaughter Pen Cut, and it crashed there, and uh, the three crew people were killed. And I believe, I, well, I'm sure it was a freight train. There was never an injury or a death on a passenger train. The passenger trains, uh, they were able to handle them safely up and down the grade. These were all freight. The freight trains are much heavier. They did a lot of coal, and coal's about the heaviest freight you can haul, so uh, they were much heavier trains. So that was in 1890. Now, 1903, this is probably the most significant wreck that occurred on the grade. Engineer was named Pitt Ballou, and he picked up his train in Asheville. Uh, it consisted of 13 loaded interstate railroad coal hoppers, two merchandise cars, which generally are box cars, no, box cars or flat cars, something like that. 
a couple other box cars and a caboose. He stopped here, the top of the grade. They set the brake retainers, and they took off. He got to that curve over there and applied the brakes. And normally when they apply the brakes, you hear a loud sort of a banging sound because all the brake shoes grab the wheels at the same time. So if you can picture that on a, about a 20-car train, bang. Well, he pulled the lever and he heard and he immediately yelled to the crew, jump off, we've lost the train. He wasn't even out of town. His caboose was right over there. He already knew he lost his train. No way to stop it. So the crew jumped off. Pitt stayed on the train trying to save it, trying to do everything he could. By the time he got to Sand Cut, it was doing well over 60 miles an hour. He knew it was going to crash, so at the last minute he jumped off. He rolled down a, a, a stone bank, and they found him nearly dead. A couple hours later, he had broken his back. They took him up to the Asheville Hospital, <clears throat> and he was in the hospital for a couple months. He woke up one morning, and he started yelling for a nurse. So the nurse thought there was something really wrong. She ran in the room. What is it? What is it? He said, Get on the phone, get the superintendent of the Southern Railway down here. I know how to save the trains from wrecking and from people getting killed. So the nurse called the superintendent, who was a man named G.R. Loyal, L-O-Y-A-L-L. -L. And he came down to the hospital and met with Pitt. And Pitt said, what you got to do is build safety runaway tracks. Right before you get the sand cut, and right before you get the slaughter pen cut, put a switch in there and have the track run uphill at a 10% grade for about 1,000 feet and just let the train run up there and gravity will, will stop it, bring it under control. And then you can fix the problem. Within six months, the railroad came down and built both safety tracks and that changed everything. That made it much, much safer to run the grade. There were still a, a number of accidents that occurred, but the loss of life was cut down. There was one more wreck that occurred after that uh, where some guys were killed. Now, think back. I showed you the pictures of the start timing sector and end timing sector. The engineer's responsibility when he was taking the train down the hill, when he saw the start timing sector, he looked at his watch. And when he got to the end timing sector, he looked at his watch. And he knew how long it should take to get between the two at eight miles an hour. If he was under control, he blew two blasts on the whistle, and the switch tender would throw that switch, and he could continue. If he was out of control, he did nothing, and up the safety track he went. And there's uh, that tall thing right there. That's the water tower over there. And you can see up in the, in the sky there, that's part of the coaling tower. This was a little passenger depot. You could actually pick the train, train up down in Melrose if you wanted to get on board and come up and visit the Apple Valley Model Railroad Club in Hendersonville. <laughs> <laughs> that is still there. And uh, eventually, over time, that became uh, electronically controlled. They, they didn't have to have a guy sitting down there anymore. One month after Pitt's accident, uh, another freight train, again 13 loaded interstate coal hoppers and a few boxcars, lost control just before sand cut. Uh, so it, it proceeded through the switch, headed down the hill, and by the time it got to Melrose, uh, it was up to about 60 miles an hour. Now this was, this was before. Remember I said it took them six months to build the safety tracks. This was one month after the accident. So the safety tracks weren't in place yet. Uh, but it was doing about 60 miles an hour when it reached Melrose. As they passed Melrose, of course the, the crew knew that the train was out of control, but they stayed on board. And I read somewhere that as the train passed that little shack and the switch tender was standing there aghast as this train is shooting by him, and the fireman was standing in the window of the locomotive, and he just went like this with a big smile on his face, and a switch tender passed out. He fainted. <laughs> fainted and fell to the ground. The crew stayed on board, 
The engineer and the fireman were buried alive under the coal when it wrecked. For all the coal from the tender, you picture this thing hitting a bank and that tender's right behind you. All that coal poured on them. They were buried alive. The brakeman had both legs cut off and he died later in the hospital. The conductor and the flagman were unhurt. Uh, they may have jumped off or they may have been at the back of the train, I don't, I don't know. But anyway, that's when three more men were killed. At this point, the local newspapers around here, uh, the Asheville Times and the newspaper over in Rutherford Town, had headlines in it saying, Southern Railway uh, seriously considering abandoning the Saluda grade. Uh, too many deaths, too much loss of equipment, and so on. So the safety tracks were coming within a few months, and, and that's what saved it. But it was just about dead uh, when, when that happened. Three days after that accident, a train started up the grade. This was called a shirt tail train. And what that uh, means is the train was too short to need the pusher locomotive. It might have had six or eight cars on it. It was going uphill and at that tallow pot rock that I pointed out right before sand cut, it started to slip and when the engineer applied the brakes, the thing started to slide backward. It slid all the way to Tryon. <laughs> all the way to Tryon. Uh, nobody was hurt. That must have been a joy ride, huh? <laughs> You know, because e even after you pass Melrose, the track doesn't level up. It continues downhill. It's just less of a grade. It's 1% to 2% instead of 5 But the train slid all the way to Tryon. In 1916, an engineer named Tom Tarpley was running a passenger train. And it was under control. It, it stopped here in Saluda, picked up passengers and so on, and he started down the grade. It was under control. Uh, and he got, down, he got down to the timing sector. He timed his train. Yep, we're in good shape. He blew the two blasts on the whistle. As he approached the safety track, the switch was thrown for him to go up the safety track. So he blew it again, and the switch tender just stood there. And the train went up the safety track and stopped. Well, he was furious. He's got a passenger train. So he jumps off the train. He ran down to the switch tender. He was about to ream this guy. Okay, this was in 1916. How many of you know the history of 1916? What happened here in 19... Right. The, the flood had washed out the bridge over Pearson Falls Road. If he had let him go, that passenger train would have been in the Pakalit River. So he saved the train by having that safety track. That, that would have been the one and only passenger wreck that would have been devastating. I thought that was a pretty interesting story. <laughs> the stranded passengers were, were put up around Saluda overnight, and the train sat on the safety track for 13 days until the bridge was repaired, and then it was, they were able to put it back in service. Diesels came along in 1949, the first diesel locomotive negotiated salute a grade. A diesel locomotive is a whole different animal when it comes to controlling a train. Do you all know that a diesel locomotive is not driven by the diesel motor? The diesel motor drives a generator that makes electricity and there are electric motors down between the wheels and the electric motors drive the train, not the diesel motor. If you think about driving a standard shift car, if you were to get out here on I-26 and start down the road and lose your brakes, if you had a standard shift car or even an automatic, you can downshift and let the motor hold you back and you can slow yourself down. Well, you can do that with a diesel locomotive. It's called dynamic braking. They actually reverse the direction of the electric motors and that back pressure will slow a train and even bring it to a stop. You can't do anything like that on a steam locomotive. So now they had control. That's why they could eventually take 100-car coal trains down the grade. They'd put like six or seven locomotives on the front and another six or seven in the middle of the train. They could take the world down the grade and control it safely without a problem. So most of the problems on the Saluda grade disappeared once they dieselized. And as I said, 1939 was the first uh, diesel.
used out here. All right, in 1964, now we're, we're talking about diesels now, they had six diesel locomotives pulling 70 loaded coal hoppers and a caboose. And they ran off the tracks, uh, up the safety track down in Melrose, uh, and the train was going so fast that it reached the end of the safety track. And at the end of the safety track, they had a big uh, pile of gravel and some logs. So it slammed to a stop. And 16, or 23 of the head end coal hoppers overturned and coal went flying all over the place. Total damage was $70,000, but no one was hurt. That was the big thing. No one was hurt. So the safety, the safety track saved lives, and there would have been more, much more damage to equipment uh, than $70,000. That was on September 20th of 64. In 1971, uh, three, locomot three diesel locomotives uh, derailed as they started up safety track number two in Melrose and 44 coal hoppers piled on top of each other in the space of seven coal hoppers. The only thing left on the tracks was the caboose when it came to a stop. No one was hurt. But uh, 44 coal hoppers damaged, so that was probably about a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of damage. When the accident happened to Pitt Bellew, and he came up with the idea for the safety tracks. They also made one other change in the rules to take a train down the grade uh, that was important. Uh, I mentioned when I talked about the coal hoppers, I identified them at the beginning of my talk as interstate coal hoppers. The interstate railroad is a small railroad that operated up in Virginia, and it primarily just hauled coal. Most of it it would take down to the port in Charleston, South Carolina. Well, the Interstate Railroad was never very profitable. They were always on hard times. And they would do things on the cheap to try to save money, make a profit. They had inferior brakes and wheels on their hopper cars. They were too small. The uh, amount of grip the brakes had was insufficient for the cars. So the, at the same time they built the safety tracks, they also enacted a rule that you could have no more than half the train could be interstate coal hoppers because the other cars had good brakes and they could compensate for it. So that was another minor change that helped, helped slow these car, uh, trains down as they were going down the grade. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Ha, 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 ha.